we'll start with the most basic is what exactly is smart content? So HubSpot have coined the term smart content, but most um, other businesses or other tools call it dynamic or adaptive content. So it's a term for um, where you have different content on an email, a website, or an ad based on the interests or past behavior of the person viewing it. It creates a personalized experience for the visitor or reader at that moment. So it takes into account factors like location, language, device type, referral source, demographics, and even behavior. So one of the most well-known examples of smart content that most people have actually come across is Amazon's recommendation engine which caters the product and service being shown based on your purchasing behavior. Um, but you can also pair it back and probably all of us have experienced good and bad versions of the personalized first name. We've all been um, called by our first name in an email and most of us have been called by some weird and wonderful other name. But we'll get to some of the pitfalls of smart content shortly and one of them is around database hygiene. Um, Using smart content ranges from that personalization field like first name or company name to images, uh, different products or showing different content um, and call to actions. So making content smart in HubSpot, how does that actually work? Um, so you should recognize this particular block over here. If you're building a landing page, these are the actual HubSpot landing page criteria for choosing smart content. So you can make content smart by country, device type, referral source, language, list, membership, and life cycle stage. If you're making content smart in an email, you only have the choice of list membership or life cycle stage because the others are not possible to be determined by the cookies in an email. So um, in an email, you have less options. So how does that work in practice? All right, so um, in practice, if I want to make something smart, so I wanna make this block smart, all I need to do is click on more, add smart rule, and then determine which rule I want to use. So if I'm going by life cycle stage, I can then add in the rule and choose the life cycle stage that I want to have. I can add in multiple rules, so I don't have to add them one by one. I can add in different rules for sales qualified lead, for opportunity, and for customer, for example. Now, anyone who doesn't meet the criteria in my SMART rule, so you'll see here, here's our SMART rules, and those are the different rules. Anyone who doesn't meet any of these criteria will be shown the default content. Anyone who meets these criteria in these or in, in the order that they're put into. So the order matters because it will check if they meet the first rule. If they meet the first rule, that's the content they'll see. If they don't meet the first rule and they meet the second rule, they will then go into that. Now, life cycle stage is pretty linear, but from a list membership point of view, it will it will go through the different stages. Um, so if they're in all three of the lists, it'll show them the content for the first list. If they then don't meet any of this criteria, they'll see the default content. So you don't get country for emails? No, if you wanted to do country, you could make lists for different countries. Because list okay. membership is pretty, um, so it would, it would mean that in terms of country, you would know, you'd have to have that as a piece of uh, information in your database so it would be in your CRM which country and then you could do lists off of that and segment on lists for emails all right so now that you've set this up um, I still haven't created any smart content I've just created the rules no we make it um, smart and put different content in based on those different rules so obviously um, just showing you how that would look but essentially you would have different content based on the different um, rules so that we, when a person meets the correct criteria, they'll see the content relating to that criteria. Um, this could be, um, so I'll throw out one or two use cases as we go, but please do think if there's anything else that you can think of. I'd love to hear your examples. 
but one would be if you were sending out a welcome email to a new customer, for example, um, who'd bought a partic particular service or a particular product, you could show a picture of the product they purchased in the header of that welcome email, rather than just showing a generic image for your brand or a logo, you could show a branded image um, of that particular product that they purchased or a banner with that particular service mentioned in it, just to show the relevance of that, you know, welcome email as a customer or even a promotion email for a product, having an image of the product you're promoting to their particular segment. Um, so that can be used in images. And again, it works exactly the same way. Um, when we don't know the information about the person, it will show the default content. Um, so we'll get to this. Uh, so one, one other question in terms of building landing pages is if you've got smart content on your landing page, how it works with Google is it actually shows the default content to Google. So when Google is indexing your page, will index the default content and it will actually ignore or not be able to see any of the smart rules. So those smart rules are about people and about the user experience and not so much about Google and being indexed. So just something to keep in mind. And then working in HubSpot is it works um, in um, from an email perspective, it works based on the information in your database. So lists and lifecycle stage, but on a landing page, it works as um, is essentially identifying the cookies stored in a visitor's browser. HubSpot identifies if a visitor has a cookie in their browser. If none exists, it looks to bucket the person into the correct setting. So device type, IP address, preferred language, location. If it doesn't meet any of those criteria, then it will check if there's a cookie from the browser and it will be able to pull that information from there. If it cannot identify any of those things or no rules that it can match exist, it will show the default content. Um, so smart content is available in HubSpot Marketing Pro and Enterprise, and you can create smart CTAs, forms, and rich te text modules and landing pages, websites, and emails. So that's where you can use smart content. Um, so Smart forms mean that you can show a different form based on different sets of rules. So for example, a customer um, may see a shorter form when filling in a, um, a download for a particular piece of content um, compared to someone who's still uh, a lead or a prospect. They, you may have more qualifying questions for them that you may already know when someone becomes a customer. So the good, the bad, and the ugly. So there, um, although we're talking about smart content and why you should do it, there's just a few um, bad and ugly things to consider around this. So the good is obviously um, smart content is a form of personalization, a way for you to um, create an experience for your um, website visitors, the people receiving your emails that is personalized to their persona or personalized content to the different um, behavior, person's lead score, level of interest, whatever it is, and provide more contextual relevant experiences. Um, so the potential of smart content is firstly that your site becomes a, a vast ecosystem of conversion opportunities because people don't have to see the same offer twice. And every landing page form CTA or email has the potential to expose a user to new content services or products and give them a more um, tailored experience that's going to lead to higher conversion rates. So that's a good potential higher conversion rates and better user experience. Well, the bad, um, and I, I've alluded to this example already, comes in the fact that because this is based on information in your database, this is based on what you've got in your CRM. Dirty data is going to lead to bad experiences or really confusing experiences for your users. So the success of your smart content is based on a clean, well-managed CRM. So if you can't um, understand, if you don't understand what drives your buyer personas, if you don't understand what drives your audience, 
to make a purchasing decision, then you're going to have a blocker because you're not going to know what to personalize. And if your data isn't correct, you're going to send people on the wrong personalized journey, which is going to be confusing for the user. So the success of your smart content is built on how well your content marketing and segmentation strategies work. So not having a clear goal, not having a clear understanding is going to make um, smart content A, very difficult to ex execute and B, very difficult to get right. And then the ugly, unfortunately, um, the fact that um, cookie tracking is where smart content is largely based on cookie tracking. It's not only um, based on cookie tracking, but it is largely based on cookie tracking. Um, that means that using smart content is going to become more and more unreliable. And remembering that on mobile, um, which is a preferred method of browsing online, cookies are actually quite unreliable. So the technology and the way of actually getting data out of smart content is becoming less and less reliable. So that's that's fine. We can still make those tailored experiences and I'm sure HubSpot will figure out smarter ways to do this in the future. But a healthy mix of static and smart content is going to give you the best kind of experience for your users. So smart content is a media means of adding to the experience, supplementing your user experience, not the only solution. If your entire page is smart and every single piece of it is smart, um, then you should probably be building separate pages for different experiences. Um, your, your website will always look the way you design it for your visitors, but there should be elements of personalization rather than making it a completely separate experience for everyone. So the ugly is no more cookies, which makes the cookie monster very sad. So when building your smart content, the first thing you need to do is determine who you're creating your smart content for. So if you know your audience, you know who you, who you're uh, like, which segments you're talking to, you can create personalized experiences for those people. So for example, if you know you're speaking to the, um, you're speaking to different people in different job roles, you can tailor the information that you're providing in that smart content based on those job roles. So depending on whether you're targeting anonymous visitors or known contacts, some rules will make more sense than others. So um, location-based could be based on a, a CRM property, but it could also be based on um, IP address and known location. Just remembering that IP address is not the most reliable in terms of country. Um, because anyone who's using a static IP or a business-based IP is actually going to appear to be, could appear to be in a different country or location from where their IP address is based. So just keeping in mind that those are less reliable than things like um, contactless membership, which a person has expressly given information about. If you're planning on creating smart content for anonymous visitors from Canada, the country rule is the most logical choice, um, but you can then segment your database and use lists as well if you want to. So you can also do MQLs from Canada and add in both of those kind of rules. Then the second thing you need to do is determine where you want to add your smart content. So now you know that you want to personalize by industry, now you say, okay, which, which parts do I want to personalize? So in this example on the right, um, we've got lifecycle stage CTAs. So our default CTA is check out our blog, but we want to, for leads and MQLs, download the free marketing blueprint template. So this is an example of a CTA that's based on lifecycle stage that allows people who are in the research phase who are actually looking for the product to get a more personal um, call to action. So because you have the option to add personalization to calls to actions, forms, rich text modules, knowing which you want to change, do you want to change the images? What do you want to personalize is going to help you then to tailor that experience and build out that tailored experience. 
and make sure that you're tailoring to the actual experience that those people so what those people are going going looking for at the time so thinking about who you want to talk to what you want to change and then before you start running off in different directions personalizing everything start with the default what is that default piece of content that's going to go out to everybody and then think about personalizing the journey so who is the the default um, going to be aimed at what is the generic going to look like and then you can build those personal experiences um, that default version is very important because anyone who is who falls outside of your smart rules is going to see that and um, if it's based on a landing page, so is Google. So you need to make it um, relevant to both of those audiences. So the next thing you need to do is determine the value of your smart content. So looking at um, personalization elements, thinking about are they going to add real value to this experience? Is making this change going to actually add to the um uh, the experience of the user so not just making everything smart but looking at the resources you have you don't have time to make every single module on a landing page or in an email smart so where can you add the most value would changing the image in the header to be relevant to the product give you um i'll use i'll use a phrase uh, nisha's gonna love but uh, is the juice worth worth the squeeze nisha <laughs> is it going to is your personalization effort is the smart content actually going to help progress content into the next contacts into the next stage of the journey the like the example that we've got oops, here the phrase the phrases you use on a cta make far more difference than the color of the button the language you use the imagery you use is far more relevant um so think about doing a b tests um or in this case, smart content that's actually going to show real difference for your users. And then determine how you'll measure performance. So if you're not, if you're setting up your smart content, how are you going to measure that it's working and that it's actually adding value to those users? So setting realistic targets that align with your strategy, seeing which of those segments is more, um, you're if targeting more effectively. Is it working? Is that juice worth the squeeze, Nisha? <laughs> so keeping in mind that those rich text content, um, those, those pages, we're going to have page views, form submissions. Um, if we have personalized forms, seeing how many people of the different kinds of, you know, in the different segments are completing the forms, which one has a better conversion rate. And being able to see if smart content is, performing better or worse than your generic content so if you notice that your smart content is underperforming compared to your generic content you may need to rethink your personalization strategy you can't just set this up and hope that it'll work because you're building out slightly more niche experiences you want them to convert better than your generic content